Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you tonight. Glad you've journeyed back to join us. Um, take you back to uh, a number of years ago when I was just a little boy. And uh, my dad uh, worked at a factory called Austin Western in Aurora, Illinois. It was probably uh, two miles or more from our home. Uh, my dad would walk that every day. The only time he would drive would be if it was raining. Uh, in the winter, he'd walk it. He loved walking in the snow, but he'd make that journey. Started work at 7 in the morning, and uh, he got done at 3.30 in the afternoon. And uh, as a little boy, I remember uh, I couldn't wait for dad to come home. Uh, we had a neat time together but I was always expecting seeing him turn the corner and start down the, the last block before he reached our house. And I, I remember that, I, and I can see it today. Um, every Christmas, um, our brother-in-law and sister and family lived in uh, Wisconsin, in Wyocena, Wisconsin area. That was a little over three hours or so from where we lived in Aurora, Illinois. My brother-in-law was a dairy farmer, so they didn't get away too often. You know, that goes down, I guess, when you're milking cows or whatever. But I couldn't wait on Christmas Day till they would come. They never came the night before. They didn't join us on Christmas Eve. My brother-in-law would milk in the morning, and then he'd get up early, get that done, and then they'd head out to our home. And I remember just waiting on Christmas Day for them to come. Uh, when they would get there, the rest of our family had been there for a while already, and that's when we'd have a big meal together. And then after that, guess what we'd do? Get to open up a few presents. So that was pretty neat. Uh, I just share that with you because uh, those are early memories that I have as I look back, special expectations, I guess, in my own heart and life. The nation of Israel. The Old Testament prophets, God would speak to them and their responsibility, their ministry was to share the truth of what God had shared with them. They would often speak of a coming Messiah, the fact that Israel had hope. He was coming soon. Uh, matter of fact, I believe there are some 37 Old Testament prophets that were fulfilled in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth. Scripture says in Galatians 4, 4, that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Jesus came to earth, just like it was prophesied that he would come. Uh, and when he came, he fulfilled prophecy. We're going to focus on that in just a few moments. We're going to look at, at one of the most powerful and heart-searching passages of Scripture, I think, in all the word of God. Uh, but before we do, I want you to take your Bibles and go back to where we were this morning in 1 John, if you would, please. 1 John, we're going to look at the first few verses again and then build from there and uh, work our way to that powerful passage of Scripture in Isaiah 53. Um, as I mentioned, one of the reasons why Jesus Christ came to earth was to fulfill prophecy. We'll develop that thought in a moment or in a few moments. But in 1 John, the Apostle John uh, tells us why Jesus came to earth. There's numerous reasons, and I want to look at a few more of those with you tonight. Um, as we mentioned this morning, uh, uh, the Apostle John uh, was a dear friend of the Lord Jesus. He was a follower. He was a, an apostle, as you know. And uh, he wrote much about uh, loving God and God's love for mankind as well. Uh, John could have very well been the best friend. He was in the inner circle of the Lord Jesus with Peter, James, and John. We mentioned this morning he was at the cross uh, when Jesus looked down at John, looked down at his mother, and he said, take care of my mom, take care of my mother, John. Uh, she's in your hands, your responsibility. Um, Barb, I guess I'd have to say, is my best friend. 
Uh, we've been married for 55 years. We dated for a few years before that, so she doesn't know the world without me, so you can pray for her. But, uh, I mean, we just share everything together, good, bad, otherwise. That's who we are, I guess, and the way it's been in our life. But I would consider her, if not my best friend, one of my dearest friends. Um, and that means a lot. Uh, can you imagine being a close friend of the Lord Jesus? Spending time as John did. Uh, John tells us in verse 1 of 1 John, he says, that which was from the beginning, he said, talking about Jesus coming from heaven's glory, that's the thought here, he was in the beginning. He goes on to tell us in this passage, he said, I've seen him, I've heard him, We've looked at him. We've touched him. He's the word of life, he said, and we're proclaiming him. He's changed our lives. He's changed our destiny, John is saying, and, and John is moved by this. And John is the one who tells us why Jesus came to earth. He, he shares that often, and I guess he ought to know because he spent some quality time for some three years or so with the Lord Jesus Christ before Jesus died, was buried, rose again, and ascended to glory. So we're going to look a little bit more here for a few moments at, at the reasons why Jesus came to earth, in a sense from John's point of view, okay? Uh, he identifies for us here. The first reason that John shares with us that Jesus came was to reveal the Father. He says that which was from the beginning, the eternal Godhead he's talking about. He said, we've heard, we've seen, we've touched. And so we testify of all of this and we proclaim it to you, this word of life. That word of life that was with the Father and has now appeared to us. That's the Apostle John telling us why, in a sense, Jesus came. Uh, he goes on in John chapter 1, you know the passage, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and it says, that Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He said, full of grace and truth. That one who came that John speaks of was full of grace and truth. All grace, 100%. And 100% truth. And what's powerful about the Lord Jesus, he didn't pull punches in either way. And if you look at how he ministered, he always began in grace. Always giving people what they didn't deserve. That's where he began and he worked his way to the truth. But he never pulled any punches when it came to the truth, did he? He is truth. And his word is truth. And so in the beginning was that word, and John tells us that that word came on purpose because the purpose behind this certainly was to reveal God the Father. In John chapter 14, Philip said to Jesus, he said, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus answered, he said, anyone who has seen me, Philip, has seen who? The Father. The Father and I, were one. I'm a part of the Godhead, he's saying. That's who I am. And I've come down here certainly for numerous reasons. One of those is to reveal God the Father. The Apostle John also said, No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. That's in 1 John 2, verse 23. So in a sense, Jesus' dear friend, the Apostle John, said that Jesus was very adamant about something. You know what it was? I and the Father are one. Very adamant about that. And John's not ashamed to tell that truth. Matter of fact, it was that truth that got him crucified. Got him crucified. Jewish leaders called that blasphemy and worthy of death. He was hung on a cross. Now, we know there's more to it than that. Uh, from a human viewpoint, that may be why he was crucified, but from God's viewpoint, there was much more to it. It was all a plan from above. The sovereign God, seated in the heavens, had that as a plan, and all that played out according to God's perfect will. Amen? So Jesus came to reveal the Father. That's one of the reasons. We talked 
about others this morning. But there's another reason. If you go with me to John, 1 John chapter 4, we'll look at verses 8 and 9. We looked at those this morning for a few moments as well. It says, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. What did he do? He sent Jesus. He sent the one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. So to display God's love, Jesus came. We know God's love in no other way. God is love, and this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might understand who God is and that God loves us. And if we're going to have any type of life, not only here, but for all eternity, we're going to have a, have a personal relationship with the one God sent. You know the verse. We quote it all the time. Matter of fact, if you watch a football game, you'll see John 3.16 display. I don't know why that's done in that way, but uh, people mock that from time to time. But what a verse. God so loved the world that he did something. Remember what he did? Sent his only begotten son. We're talking about why Jesus came. Because God loved us. God wanted us to experience and to know his love. Love is being loyal. It means benevolent care and concern for the well-being or the good of someone else. Certainly, it was God caring about the well-being and good of his creation. More specifically, he was concerned for the heart and soul of the human race And God was spurred on as he cared for the world by his unconditional affection for you and me. So there's a couple reasons why Jesus came. He came to reveal the Father, and he came to reveal and display the Father's love. He also came, according to 1 John chapter 1, John again saying, he came to give life. Came to give life in its fullness to the fullest. This is what John says, that which was from the beginning, 1 John 1, 1 through 3 again, that which was from the beginning, we've heard, seen, touched, he's the word of life, we testify of him, we proclaim him, so that we might have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, and together as believers we fellowship, so that our joy may be full and complete. You talk about life in its fullest. It's when a person has a relationship with God and relationship with others who know God. That's sweet fellowship. You know what fellowship is? That's a couple guys hanging out in a ship. I don't know how else to say it. That's what sweet fellowship is. Hanging out in a boat together, I guess, right? Fellow, fellows in a ship. I kind of look at it that way. Um, You better get along if you're hanging out in a fishing boat together. But uh, sweet fellowship, John says, I'm having that because of Jesus, he's saying, and I want you to have it. We all want to have that among each other. John said this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live in and through him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. So isn't it amazing what John's telling us, that close friend of the Lord Jesus? The Apostle John, it's just packed full. As you read all five chapters of 1 John, so often you'll run across this thought, this is why Jesus came. This is why the Father sent the Son. One of those reasons was to give life in its fullness and to the fullest. What's that involve, to have life in its fullness, to a fullness? Well, it's very simply a personal relationship. It's a personal relationship that we can have with the Father, Almighty God, the Holy God, that comes about in and through the finished work of the one that the Father sent, his Son, so that we might live, we might be alive spiritually. You can't live unless you're alive, and we're spiritually dead till we meet the Son of the Heavenly Father. There's no other way to have life. We have that life. It's given to us in and through the work of the Son. And as we become alive spiritually, then we begin to grow spiritually. And eternally, we're alive and we grow until we're mature. And one of these days, we'll be like unto Jesus. In the meantime, we're to be conformed to him more and more today than we were yesterday. Eternally, we're going to be in him. 
for all eternity. Right now, we're in him, and he's working in us and through us and with us, not only to honor and glorify him, but to be an encouragement to one another. Uh, Isn't it amazing what God had in mind in the sending of his son? Um, We hear this a lot these days about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. That's a lie. It's a lie. Uh, Not everybody is a child of God. It's, It's taught that way and it's shared that way that God is the father of all of us. Okay? But you don't, can't know the Father unless you know the one he sent, his Son. So the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man is one way of putting it, but it's the false side of things. We must have a personal relationship with God through the one that he sent, the Lord Jesus. So Jesus came for a number of reasons. The third one tonight was to give life in its fullest. Uh, in its fullness. Go with me, if you would, to Isaiah 52. It's a long way from 1 John, but if you'll work your way back. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. We talked a little bit about Jesus being sent by the Father for numerous reasons. A key reason was to fulfill prophecy. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, begins a passage that, to me, as I said, is one of the most powerful and heart-searching passages in all of Scripture. Jesus came to fulfill prophecy. Look what it says, verse 13. Talking about the Lord Jesus, my servant. He'll act wisely. He'll be raised and lifted up. He'll be highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Verse 1, chapter 53. Who has believed the message or the report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of a dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. There was nothing in his appearance that we would desire him. Matter of fact, he was despised and rejected of men. Man of sorrows, familiar with suffering and grief. And like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. He was punished that brought peace upon him. By his wounds were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many he will bear their iniquities therefore I will give him a portion among the great he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors 
This passage was written 600 and some years prior to Jesus coming to earth. This is a prophecy that God shared with the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah shared what God had shared with him. And it was about a coming Messiah, and it talked about what was going to happen as that Messiah came. It talk, talked about him bearing someone's infirmities and carrying someone's sorrows. It talked about him being pierced for people's transgressions and crushed for their iniquities. It talked about punishment coming upon him. And by that punishment, he'd be wounded, and his wounds would cause healing. People have gone astray. They've turned to their own way. The Father sent the Son, Isaiah said, or will send the Son, in order to redeem them, to set them free. They've gone astray. They've turned to their own way. But because of what's going to happen to the one prophesied in coming, they're going to have hope. He's going to be oppressed and afflicted, but he's not going to open his mouth. He's going to be led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep would be sheared, he's going to be silent. He's not going to open his mouth. He's not going to reject. He's not going to fight back. He's going to be cut off from the land of the living because of someone else's transgression. It's amazing to me. This is all being prophesied 600 and some years before it ever happened. And then in verse 10 of chapter 53... We're told why this is happening. You know why this is happening? Because it's God's will. It's the will of God for Jesus to come and to do all this. He has to come because that righteous servant, the Lord Jesus, is going to be the key to justifying many. That's you. And that's me. That's our only hope. Because he poured out his life unto death. Because he was numbered with the transgressors. Because he bore the sin of many. God was satisfied and propitiated with what Jesus did. Raised him to glory. And he's at the right hand of the Father right now. Doing exactly what verse 13 or verse 12 of chapter 53 said. He's not done with his ministry. He's making intercession for you and I. If we're believers tonight, that's the Savior that was prophesied in Isaiah 52 and 53. Prophecy is a prediction. Prophecy is something to come. It's the inspired declaration of divine will and purpose in this context. That's what prophecy is. As I mentioned, I believe there's some 37 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And is coming to earth. Uh, ten, ten of those prophecies relate to his birth in early years. Thirteen of those prophecies relate to his, I'm sorry, ten of those relate to his birth in early years. Thirteen relate to his earthly ministry, to that earthly journey. Thirteen more relate to his death, burial, and resurrection. One relates to the fact that he's going to ascend to glory. Now, all of this is shared before, the Je before Jesus ever comes to earth. Before what we call Christmas ever happened, all of this was prophesied. So before we go any further tonight, uh, can you think of some prophecies that you know of in Scripture that were prophesied, Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus? And I can check you out here because I brought a list of the 37 with me. All right. Anybody want to share? Anything come to mind? Pardon? Born of a virgin. That's the first one on my list. Isaiah 7, 14. It was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Born of a virgin. Is that unique? Has that ever happened before? Was that prophesied? Did it happen? Fulfilled prophecy. Right? Give me another one. Anyone? I'm sorry? Okay. All right. Jesus was coming 
prophesied to bear the sin of a world that was desperately in need, separated from him, right? That was fulfilled in Jesus' coming. The son of David, David, okay? On the throne of his father David for a few days, right? How about forever? Huh? So we can identify that. We're going to be with him forever, aren't we? If we know Jesus. What'd they call him? What was his name? Jesus, but yeah, Emmanuel. What's that mean? God with us. Isaiah 7, 14. Matthew 1, 23. You're to name him. He's called Emmanuel. You're to name him Jesus. He's the coming Messiah. Someone else. Born in Bethlehem. Okay. That's in Micah, right? Micah 5, 2. To be born in Bethlehem. That's where he was born, right? Old little town of St. Louis. No, a little town of Bethlehem. We see you as we look down upon it. What a special thing. Keep going. Anybody else? Sorry? Bruised for our iniquities. Chastised for our peace. We just read about that. Did that happen? That and much, much more, right? Yes, sir. He called my son out of Egypt, right? Why did he have to head down to Egypt? Because Herod was killing all the babies two years and under, and they had to get him out of there. God knew all about that, and it was prophesied before it ever happened. Years and years before it ever happened. Amazing, isn't it? Yes, sir. They cast lots for his clothes at the cross, remember? Who did that? Soldiers, didn't they? Isn't that amazing when you start thinking back? There's some 37 of these that took place. I mean, remember it talked about him entering Jerusalem in a triumphant way. And uh, we talk about that. We call that, I like to look at that as the Jerusalem parade that took place on Palm Sunday in our, in our minds today. Uh, that was fulfilled. Um, he was to be called a Nazarene, Remember? That's one of the reasons why when Mary and Joseph came back from Egypt, where did they head? To Nazareth. So Jesus could fulfill that prophecy. Uh, we talked about him healing many in numerous ways, not only physically, but spiritually. It was said in Isaiah 6 he was going to speak in parables. Uh, it was said in Isaiah 53, uh, something that, that is powerful. Says that one who's going to come and do all of this, what's going to happen to him? They're going to accept him, right? No, they're going to reject him. They're going to reject him. Isn't that amazing? Uh, this is Israel's Messiah. It's our Savior that's being talked about here and prophesied about 600 years prior to what's happening. To me, it's very detailed, it's very clear, isn't it? It's as though it's happening before our very eyes when we read this. But when he comes, Israel and basically the world rejects him as Messiah. He was in the world. The world was made by him and through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own rejected him, did not receive him. But... This includes me and you, as many as received him. To them gives he the right or the power to become the children of God. Not everybody's a child of God, only those that he gives the right to become the child of God. That's why it's not the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. There must be a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus in order to be a child of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, We must be born again. We must be born of God. We must be born from above, born of the Spirit of God. Jesus was the substitute. He was the propitiation, as we shared this morning. He was the rescuer, and he rescued us. He rescued the human heart and soul by redemption at the cross of Calvary, just like it's predicted hundreds of years before it happened. And as he comes... And gives his life. 
fulfills that. He's reconciling a sinful heart like yours and mine to a holy God. Rescued through redemption and reconciled to Almighty God. God went nowhere. He's always been where he's at. He's always been who he is. Mankind's the one who fell into sin. And we've been rescued by a Savior sent by the Father. And we've been redeemed, bought out of the slave market of sin at Calvary by that very one God sent. And as a result of that, we've been reconciled. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But, but, changes the whole story. But, even though all that's true, but, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was chastised for our peace. And by his stripes, we are healed. Yes, like sheep, we went astray. We turned every one to our own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, Jesus came. He came to identify, in a sense, the Father, so that we would understand who the Father was. He came to display what unconditional, agape type love is, the love of the Father. He came so that you and I could have fullness of life, life in its fullness. Uh, he came to fulfill prophecy. Scripture is full of prophecy, isn't it? But I want you to go one other place with me before we close tonight. I want you to go back to 1 John. John, first. John's kind of becoming my friend these days. Well, I read about it. I'm amazed at what he has to say about his dear friend, the Lord Jesus, who was more than a friend. He was his Savior, his Lord, his King. First John chapter 3. I want you to go to a key passage, verse 7. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of who? The devil. the devil. Because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. Did you ever think about this? You want another reason why Jesus was sent by the Father? Here it is. The reason the Son of God appeared or was manifested was why? Destroy the works of the devil. Is that important? Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as Jesus, as he is righteous. But he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And so, does God care? God took on the devil once and for all. And for this purpose, he sent his son. The Son of God was manifested and appeared that he might destroy the works of the devil. I'm putting that last on our list of what we've walked through tonight because the devil is here to destroy. Destroy means to ruin thoroughly. It means to spoil. It means to tear down or tear apart. It means to break up. It means to loosen up things to the extent where he can dissolve them. That's the devil at work. Satan deceives, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because there's an adversary or enemy out there called the devil who walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But he's not only going about as a roaring lion, he goes about as an angel of light. He's not one. He just acts that way at times. And we buy into that, don't we? Resist him, it says. Steadfast in what? Take faith. Trust. Trust in what? Trust.
Trust in who? Trust in Almighty God who loved you and I enough to send his son. And we've just walked through a number of things today that he sent his son to do. And if you remember this morning, part of that was to save a lost and dying world. And the way he did that is dealing with sin. Taking sin away. The devil deceives. The devil blinds. Scripture says the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of those who don't know Jesus. They don't understand. They're blinded so that they cannot even see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That ought to rattle our cage tonight. Do you realize that God opened your eyes and my eyes, if we're saved tonight, to the truth of the gospel when most of the world doesn't have a clue? Why would God seek me out? Why would he do that? Why would he seek you out? Do you see the need of you and I sharing Jesus? The world is blinded to the truth. And the devil's right behind it all. He's foundational to that. It says the God of this world blinds the minds of folks who don't know Jesus so that they cannot see the truth of the gospel. And Paul summarized the gospel this way, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again according to the scripture. That's the simple gospel. We don't have to be a deep theologian. We don't need all kinds of education. We just need to simply share with others what Jesus has done for us. It's a powerful truth. One of the ways we do that was something that I shared at my brother-in-law's funeral a number of years ago. My brother-in-law said very little, if anything. Uh, he was a middle school principal. Uh, he kind of built a program dealing with those who were struggling in, 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 in many ways in, in, in grade school, elementary school, and so forth, and came across, alongside the needy and helped build some programs. But he very seldom said much. We should always be like my, my brother-in-law, Ed Close. He's been with the Lord for quite a while. But Ed Close very seldom said much verbally. But I'll tell you what, he backed it up. He backed it up by, by the way he lived. We should always share the, the gospel, and when necessary, we should use words. That makes sense? Amen. Most of us use words all the time, but our life doesn't normally back up what we say. God looks at things so different. Jesus didn't have to say much. He did from time to time. But people followed him all over the place because of his lifestyle, because of his testimony, because of the way he displayed the Father's love and care. And he did that all the way to the cross of Calvary. And then when they hung him there, he looked down upon them and he said, you know what, Father? I could call 10,000 angels or more to get me off this cross. But he said, Father, forgive them. They don't have a clue what they're doing. They don't know who I am. If they understood who I was, they wouldn't be doing this. They, they don't get it, he said. They don't understand. Father, forgive them. That, that is an amazing truth, isn't it? So the story of Christmas, why Jesus came to earth, is quite a story, isn't it? He came to reveal the Father, to display God's love, to give life in its fullness, to be the Savior of the world, to take away sin, to destroy the works of the devil. And then for things that were predicted about his coming, hundreds of years prior, he came to fulfill all that. You know what? My Bible tells me that Jesus is coming again. Does your Bible tell you that? That's a prophecy. It hasn't happened yet. I think I'm ready. Are you ready? You know, Jesus is coming again. Let not your heart be troubled. Right? If you need it, go with me to John 14. Let not your heart be troubled, verse 1. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, guess what? I'm coming back again. 
I'm coming back again for you, and I'm going to take you to be where I am so that you can be there with me. That's my desire. That's what I'm going to do, he said. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. He said, you know, you know the place where I'm going. And then Thomas speaks up, and he said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how in the world can we know the way? What's Jesus say? I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I mean, he summarized it pretty well. I'm the way to get there. Everything needs to be measured by me because I'm the truth. And I'm life. Most people don't have life. But if they know me, they'll know the way. They'll know the truth. And they'll know life. No one comes to the Father, Jesus said, but by me. So your heart doesn't have to be troubled tonight if you know Jesus. Matter of fact, one of my favorite songs is, What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Amen. Amen. Let me close with an interesting poem here. Just another baby boy born in Bethlehem town. One more hungry mouth to feed and so the world slept on. It was a weary, captive world, gripped tight in Rome's domain. The chilling fear of tyranny fast held them like a chain. Another baby, more or less, what difference could he be? One more soul to bear the pain and share their misery. So past mankind a winter's night, those beaten down by sin, too dull to hear angelic strains that rove above the din. So near two millenniums have passed since God took human frame. The world runs its appointed course, but never more the same. He gathered up the captive's chain once forged for you and me, and he broke the foul tyrant's grip and purchased liberty. Now looms above the manger bed a message for all men. He died, he lives, he intercedes, he's coming back again. Then herald forth the joyous word, our voices lift as one. The babe who slept in cattle stall is God's triumphant son. Amen. Amen. Father, we're grateful. That's all we can say. We don't know how else to put it. We are so grateful that you thought enough of us and loved us to the extent that you gave your only begotten son. And Lord Jesus... I have to thank you tonight that you came willingly. You didn't battle it. You didn't turn it away, but you came. You sweat drops of blood, as it were, in the making of that decision. And you said, not my will. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through this, but yours be done. And you, you were obedient to the Father. You're God, I understand. I, I don't know how all this works out. But you willingly obeyed the Father. And Holy Spirit, the third part of the Godhead, I thank you for convicting our hearts and bringing us to Jesus. Without you wooing us, we have no hope. In the moment we trusted the Lord Jesus as the way, truth, and life, you came inside of us. And you indwell us tonight, Holy Spirit, and you immediately, the moment we trusted Jesus, placed us in a body of believers, the church. And we are so grateful. Help us be the church. Help us to be a testimony as the church to those who don't know you. Don't let us get in the way. And when necessary, give us the words to say. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. He's certainly worthy. Amen.